All right, guys, this is the first lecture of Unit 4 on sensation and perception. We are only going to cover the senses in the online lectures, and we'll cover the difference between sensation and perception when we get back to school. What you need to do is copy down anything that is bold or blue from the notes, and again, you should have accessed the online chart on Edmodo, and you should be filling in that senses chart as you listen. We will have a quiz on all of the senses as soon as we get back. And if you have questions, go ahead and post them or email them to me because this is a very, very important lecture. So when we talk about the senses, a process of transduction occurs where we convert one form of energy to another. The transformation of this one energy to another energy into neural impulses is called transduction. So right now the energy that is coming from the light that you are seeing in your eye is then turned into a neural message that the brain processes into what you consciously see. And the physical characteristics of light that help determine our experience of color and brightness determine on the wavelength and the intensity. The wavelength is the distance from one wave peak to another, like you see in the first diagram. The wavelength helps determine the color or hue, like blue or green, whereas the intensity is the amount of energy in the light waves, which is determined by how tall the wavelength is, so the height, and that is what helps us determine brightness. Now all of this energy is processed through our eye. And the way that the eye works is very complicated. It always takes me a few times to explain it before students get it. So don't feel like uh, you completely don't understand. You probably just have to listen to this a few times. So when light enters, enters the outermost part of the eye. It's passing through the cornea. This is the surface of the eye that protects your eye. So if you ever scratch your cornea, you know that it's the outermost surface of the eye. The cornea is important for bending light and helping that light focus on other parts of the eye. Once light passes through the cornea, it then goes to the pupil of the eye, which is the adjustable opening. The size of the pupil is regulated by a muscle called the iris. The iris is what is the color of your eye. Now the iris either dilates or constricts based on how much light is passing through the pupil and the iris. So the iris helps control the size of the pupil. Behind the pupil, as you see here, is the lens. And the lens is responsible for helping to focus the image on the retina. So what happens is accommodation, the process of accommodation occurs where the shape of the lens will actually change based on how close an object is to your eye or how far away it is. So the lens right here will change shape. The lens literally projects the image onto the back of the retina. And if you see, the image of this candle is projected upside down. Your brain is what flips that image right side up. Now the retina is extremely important because this is where we find both rods and cones and we'll come back and talk about that in a second. But real quick, again, this is how light passes through the eye. It enters the cornea, it passes through the pupil, which is regulated by the iris. Then behind the pupil you find the lens which helps to focus the image on the retina, on the back of the eye. So you've got the cornea, the iris, the lens, and the retina. Those are the parts of the eye that are extremely important. And then behind the pupil, you've got the lens. So if you look at this example, if not a lot of light is entering the eye, you see the shape of the lens here. Whereas a close focus, something that's closer in literally to your eye, the lens is going to change color, or excuse me, the lens is going to change shape and then help focus that image on the back of your retina. And again, accommodation occurs when the shape of the lens changes to focus the object that is either near or far. 
Now, if you're nearsighted, this means that the eyeball is actually misshapen and your eyeball focuses light rays in front of your retina. Whereas farsightedness, the light rays, once they reach your retina, they actually reach your retina before they have focused the image. So those of you who are either nearsighted and farsighted, that's kind of what's occurring in your lens. And the retina is extremely important. Once the light breaks the outer surface of the retina, it is then buried in these receptor cells, which are called rods and cones. Rods are important for processing black and white vision, whereas cones are important for processing color vision. And after the rods and cones in your retina have been activated, the optic nerve carries them to the brain. Now where the optic nerve, or nerve leaves the eye is called the blind spot. And we'll, um, in a lab that we're gonna be doing in this unit, we'll help you find your blind spot. Your book also goes through some activities where you can find your blind spot. Now, in the retina, the rods and the cones um, cluster around the fovea. Specifically, only the cones are clustering around that fovea part of the eye, which is the central focus image. Rods, again, are important for helping look at black and white vision, whereas cones are clustering around the fovea, and they are responsible for color vision. We have more rods than cones. If you think about it like high-def television versus black and white television, the cones are important for processing that high def color vision and the rods would be black and white vision. Now once the optic nerve carries the information from the retina, it then is processed through the thalamus. The thalamus again is the sensory switchboard that is sending the message from the optic nerve to the thalamus. The thalamus processes the information and sends it to our visual cortex which is in the occipital lobe of our brain. Again, if it falls in your right field of vision, it's gonna cross the chiasm here into the optic nerve. The optic nerve leaves the eye, the thalamus, processes the information, and it's sent to the left visual cortex of the occipital lobe. So that's how the eye works. We're gonna talk about theories of vision really quickly. One theory of vision is that our visual cortex and our occipital lobe actually has different feature detector neurons that help us figure out the edges and the angles and the movement of objects that we're looking at. When different neurons are activated, we process that image, edges, angles, and movement. So if something is coming at you very quickly, it's moving very quickly at you, you're gonna have one type of neuron in the visual cortex stimulated, whereas if you're having to dodge around a corner to prevent from banging your hip on it, other neurons would be activated in the eye. Now, another theory of visual processing is the parallel processing. This theory says that when, our, when we look at a scene, whether it's a painting or a landscape, our brain divides that scene into different categories, different information. We are processing the color, the depth, the movement, and the form of that scene all at the same time. So for example, if you've ever seen a familiar face in a crowd, this is what's happening. Your brain is integrating that information that is passing through your retina, is being sent from the thalamus to the visual cortex, and it's comparing it to stored information in your hippocampus that enables you to recognize someone as being a friend or recognize someone as being someone that you actually do know. So again, to kind of reiterate this point, you're looking at the scene right here. Your retina is processing the information through its rods and cones. The feature detector theory says the different neurons in your visual cortex are responding to the edges, lines, and angles of the scene. The parallel processing theory says that all of this is happening at the same time. Your color, movement, form, and depth are all being processed, and then you recognize this as being the sport of diving. Now, theories of color vision, the um, most prominent and oldest theory is the trichromatic theory, where Young and Hemholtz said that we have three receptor cells in our retina that are sensitive to red, blue, and green colors. And when we stimulate a combination of these cones, we see other colors. So for example, there are no receptor cells in your retina that help process the color yellow. But when red and green receptor cells are activated at the same time, we see yellow. If you are colorblind, 
what happens is you lack those three receptor cells. And it's a gen genetic disorder where normal individuals have the trichromatic receptor cells, so we have the three, whereas colorblind individuals only have one or two. It's called monochromatic or dichromatic. And basically what ends up happening is that people are blind to green and red colors, which means that those receptor cells aren't being activated at the same time, therefore they cannot see other colors. The opponent color theory says that we wear down certain receptor cells, certain cones, and when we look at a white surface after those neurons have been, after those cells have been worn down, we see the opponent color. So after leaving the cells or the cones, visual information is processed in terms of their opponent color. So red's opponent color is green, blue's opponent color is yellow, black's opponent color is white. And this helps to explain after image. So after images. So if you were to stare at that flag that just disappeared for long enough, when it does disappear, stare at the dot and report whether or not you see Britain's flag's color. So you were looking at red and green. The opponent colors of red and green or excuse me, you were looking at green and yellow. The opponent colors for green would be red and the opponent colors for yellow would be blue. So you actually should have that after image of Great Britain's flag. I have another cool um, way in which you can test the after image theory. quickly off to the side and then back to the dot you should see the black and white photo and then the color should reappear when you get back to the black dot. It's probably starting to fade now. You're all probably familiar with the idea that a TV screen makes colors using red, green and blue pixels at each point. Each color we see is a particular mixture of these colors. Our eyes aren't TV screens of course but they do contain three types of color sensitive receptors known as cones. One sensitive to red wavelengths of light, one green and one blue. So the way the brain sees different colors is by looking at the relative activity across three types of cones. So when you've stared at the strangely colored building, you are in fact tiring out or fatiguing the three types of cones in different ways across the photo. The area of grass is painted mauve, for instance, and this fatigued the red and blue cones that have a view of the grass more than the green cone. When we now replace the strange photo with a black and white photo, we are in fact seeing color created by different levels of fatigue in each of the cones. The brain only knows about different colors by looking at relative activity across the three types of cones. Remember I said if you moved your eyes when looking at the black and white photo, the color after image disappears? Well, this is interesting because this tells us that the structure of the scene you use to see the after image must be similar to the structure of the scene you use to tire the cones out with. Any old building won't do. And the same building placed in different positions on the retina won't do either. This may explain why we don't see color after all right, so that's a pretty cool YouTube video. I would suggest um, doing it a few times. Your brain actually does think that it's a color, color image, but it is black and white. So that's going to do it for the eye. Remember, you should be getting down things that are bold and blue. You should be copying down your this information into the five senses chart because we will have a quiz when we get back to school the day we get back to make sure that you understand this information fully. If you have questions, please let me know. I'll be posting more online lectures on the ear and then the other senses later on today.